continue on with the last uh, lecture of the break of the session here. The doctor mentioned how to come back and talk to us update on IPM. Morning again. Can you hear me? Everyone? Okay, we are going to talk about current state of. Uh, well, I guess I can move around now. <laughs> current state of interventional pain management or current state of interventionalists who are practicing <laughs> interventional pain management. So, you have been hearing all these things, right? We have a lot of duplications. So we keep saying the same things over and over again. The reason being nobody listens. So this is what this is what was said sometime in 1700s or 1800s. So everything has been said before, but since nobody listens, we have to keep going back and beginning all over again. So that is how we are going to start again. Let us begin all over again, have a fresh beginning. So what is our state of US healthcare? Overdiagnosed, overtreated, overcharged, AIG. What does AIG stand for? Arrogance, <laughs> ignorance, and greed. <laughs> so where does that lead to you? the same place where AIG went and where the whole world went down. Bankruptcy. So that is where we are heading for unless we are careful. So we are spending $303 trillion a year on healthcare. That is 18% of GDP. 30% of it is unnecessary care. 30%. Now we are not even talking about unproven. This is just unnecessary. There is more for unproven care. And dissatisfaction. Patients are dissatisfied. Providers are dissatisfied. Regulators are dissatisfied. Prayers are, payers are dissatisfied. So we are very, very unhappy people here. Everybody is dissatisfied. Nobody is happy. This is the picture which shows the state of our health care. We are spending about $183.5 billion on musculoskeletal system. Out of that, about $89 billion goes to low back and neck pain. This is from 2013 statistics. Low back and neck pain, those are the expenditures. They keep going up. Most of the expenditures are related to the outpatient care. So why, how do we over-diagnose? How many of you know the new guidelines on high blood pressure or hypertension or hypercholesteremia? So I, you know, only one? You guys don't know? We just added 31 million people to this enroll. We made 31 million people sick because <laughs> we just changed the norms. <laughs> like when they change it in the, early uh, cholesterol level, which was supposed to be 240, up to 240 was normal. In olden days, I was used to run my cholesterol around 210. No treatment, nothing, I was doing pretty good. Then they changed it to 200 to norm. I suddenly became hypercholesteremic. Then they changed the weight norms. I became overweight. I was normal weight. <laughs> But I became overweight. So I started taking Lipitor. I started experiencing body pains. So I went to an interventional pain physician. <laughs> started having all types of treatments. And all these patients who are receiving tight control of high blood pressure, they get admitted to the hospital because they're having strokes. They are having heart attacks. Their blood pressure goes too low. 
The same thing goes with the diabetes. So we are making people sick. And these are all wonderful guidelines. Where do they come from? You really deeply look into it. I was showing my disclaimer. My disclaimer is only one or two lines. You should see the disclaimers of these people who write these guidelines. They run about three pages sometimes. They get so much money from this industry, that industry. So, they, but they become great because they are published by American Heart Association, American Cardiology Association, and they are published in JAMA and New England Journal of Medicine. We get the credibility for that. So, just recently, within the last 18 months, we added 31 million people with changes in the hypertension. Now, they want you to maintain blood pressure, 90 to 100, diastolic blood pressure. Now they reduced it to, that was old one, 80 now, 70 or 80. So everybody is going to be on medication. Then they said cholesterol is good. They made a big deal about uh, hyperlipidemia. And they won't even measure your coronary calcium levels. This all started with Trump and Sanjay Gupta. He said his coronary calcium was high. And I didn't know that that had any relevance to Nobody ever measured my coronary calcium. Did they ever measure your coronary calcium? There are a lot more people here. Did you get measured? <laughs> and that became a big issue. Now they are all measuring everybody's coronary calcium levels. <laughs> so here goes our expenses. And I'm serious about these people. There are studies when I was saying that uh, one of my best friends from Congress, he started complaining of his old body pains. And they were very similar to mine. I said, why are you having these pains? And we started looking at it. He just started on the cholesterol medication six months ago. So we changed it. I changed my medicine. I changed his medicine. And nothing. We still had the same problem. So you can't get out of it. So this patient who is a paranoid, and let us say that not him, but somebody else who is paranoid and goes to a doctor, with all these body pains. You start pressing on the neck and the back, you have some tenderness on the facet joints, some muscular pain. Depends on your trigger point joint or a facet joint, guy. <laughs> start doing nerve blocks on them and they respond and they, you start burning them, radio frequencies. And it goes on, we put some on opioids and they become big interventional pain patients. So we create patients like this by over diagnosis. So how are we doing with our <coughs> IPM procedural characteristics? If you really look at the media, they say that our procedures are increasing. Are they really increasing? Those are the global statistics, they're not. Overall, we are decreasing. That's the good news part. I'm going to give you a lot of bad news in a few seconds. <laughs> so that the overall is there is a dec decline in Epidurals are going down. Facet joints and SI joints will combine are slightly up. Disc procedures are going down. This is how facet joint interventions are. So only one procedure which is going down is lumbar facet joint injection from 2009 to 2016. So this is before Obama became the president. And this is after, because the Affordable Care Act and so many things changed, so that's why we demarcated there. So overall, we are going down. This is just for lumbar. If you just look at the lumbar, lumbar interlaminar epidural injections have gone down 6% per year from 2009 to 2016. But not in Kentucky, probably, or in Ohio, because these are the people, everybody I talk to, they're doing 60 procedures, including six radio frequencies a day, five days a week. If you do all those things, every patient in Ohio, every patient, every person in Ohio and Kentucky will be receiving two procedures per year. We are doing that many procedures the way everybody's talking about. But statistics don't show that. Interlaminar epidural. So where are the increases? going to the radio frequency neuronal. Thoracic radio frequency, cervical radio frequency neurolysis 
and lumbar radiofrequency neurolysis. These things are going up. <coughs> now, look at the adhesolysis procedures. If you look at the entire hall of procedures, they have gone down 42%. But if you just look at for 100,000 Medicare population, they went down 53%. So there is a significant drop in percutaneous adhesolysis procedures. Now, epidurals also, there is increase in transforaminal epidurals, but there is a decline in interlaminar epidural injections. Now, he was saying that they were both similarly effective, but there is a difference in your reimbursement patterns. You have to focus on reimbursement too, because you have to survive to practice. That is also an important part, but we have to be reasonable. We have to still meet indications and medical necessity. So we have to do what is necessary, not be greedy, not AIG. So this is the front page article in New York Times. So I did a three hour interview with this lady and corresponded about 30 pages of materials or more. And only one sentence said was she spoke with Dr. Manchikanti and he said he doesn't use Depomedrol. That's all. We went through the evidence, how it is con construed and everything else, but she didn't want to use any of those things. So our doctor, after doctors cut their opioids, patients turned their risky treatment of back pain. We are talking about the epidural. They are classifying epidural as a very risky base treatment and it is going to paralyze patients and kill them. How many people tell the patients, you all use steroids, right? You're all addicted to steroids. <laughs> so do you ever tell your patient that it is off-label what you're doing? How many of you tell it is off-label? Only one? Okay, you should all tell the patients that it is off-label. If they want to use them, that's fine. If they don't want to, just do with local anesthetics. Try a few times, it works as good as Indian. I'm going to speak 45 minutes on opioid epidemic tomorrow. If you have time, come and visit me. <coughs> so US has 44% of world population consumes 70% of opioids in 2014. 99% of hydrocodone. <coughs> that is because no other country sells hydrocodone except US. 73% of oxycodone. But what is happening? It is coming down. Number of prescriptions are coming down. From 250 million prescriptions in 2013, we have come down to 196. And it was actually highest number was in 2010, which was 275 million prescriptions. So prescriptions are coming down. So we are doing a good job, right? Trying to reduce them the number of people getting prescriptions per hundred. So at one time in 2006, 72% of the American population were receiving at least one prescription. Now 2016, 66.5. Now 2017 data probably 64 or so. So this is the decrease, not only the number of prescriptions, but the amount, the dosage has been decreasing. And when you use the robust PDMPs, Ohio doesn't have a very robust P, I, I think it is. Ohio has a good PDMP, right? Yeah. So you are forced to use them. So they are comparing four states. I think Ohio is one of them. So I just got the data for Kentucky. They compared Kentucky and Missouri. You can see the difference. Missouri started going up. We just got Missouri past the their PDMP. Now we have PDMPs in all the states. We worked hard at this ASIP did by passing NASPER and going with it. So you have Missouri is going up, <coughs> Kentucky is going down. So is this all good or bad? What did we do? Shift it into bad health. What? There's a shift to the street. Good answer. So we are controlling on one aspect, and 
when you put so much tight control, it is like diabetes, hypertension. We control it so tightly, then we get all these side effects. Patients go to the hospital, they have the strokes and everything else. The same thing is happening with our opioids. We are becoming a little bit opiophobic. I was always opiophobic, but that's what they used to call me. I kind of liked that name before, but now I don't like it. <laughs> so, that is probably becoming bad. Now, this is the latest data which just came on Wednesday from CDC, just two days ago. So a lot of people may have not seen, but if you read a lot of news, it is all over the news. I saw it at least 20 times on the news since Wednesday. So what happened? Opi opioid deaths, are, overdose deaths are increasing. There were 63,532 and now there are 72,000. 13% increase, 68%, 16% increase. But where was the increase? So this is the thing we are looking at is ours. So they went up to 14, we have only 3.7% increase for prescription opioids and not much for methadone. But all the, most of the increase in the synthetic, synthetic opioids, that is the fentanyl. And heroin didn't increase that much actually. I guess it decreases some, or uh, increases mildly. But cocaine is going up, methamphetamine is going up. So we may not be doing what we are supposed to be doing. This is all again quantification. But who do they blame for this opioid crisis? Even patients blame doctors. <laughs> we blame the patients. They blame the, like this failed back surgery syndrome. We call it failed back surgery syndrome, and neurosurgeons call it failed epidural syndrome. <laughs> and they are addicted to opioids. We are addicted to steroids. <laughs> So how did we advance? This is how, this is the first pain doctor in the world. James Sickert in 1901 described the epidural. There were no steroids in those days until 1953. All these years they were only using local anesthetics and people were responsive. We have the definition, we went through that and uh, if you attended the meeting before but I don't have too much time to go over. But some of the things are specialty board, board certification, and competency certifications. Now, we have been advancing quite a bit. We used to do three epidurals. Patient used to be in the recovery room, sit down, put a needle, and it comes two more times whether he did got better or not. And now we progress to fluoroscopy, that's a joint interventions. Now we are going into so many stimulation patterns and dorsal root ganglion stimulation, interspinous prosthesis, all these things are going, platelet rich plasma. Evidence assessment, this is the important part. We need to understand when Ken was talking about the evidence-based review, I was just questioning him, not that I don't know the answer, but I wanted to see what his response was. They called it an evidence-based review, but it's not really evidence-based review. As he said, it is opinion-based review. That's all it is. So if you don't know what you're looking at, you can't go with it. This is what New England Journal of Medicine editor-in-chief said. It's simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or rely on the judgment of trusted physicians, that is where all these guidelines are developed, or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as editor-in-chief. The most entrenched con conflict in our minds is we can't change our previously held opinions. This is something our Palomato writes a letter saying that how there is no evidence for adhesiolysis. They are saying that we compared the same groups from baseline to the treatment, which is very appropriate. That is what is called a single arm analysis. But unfortunately, we did not do that. <laughs> In this systematic review, we did two arm analysis. I'm saying we because I was in peripherally involved. I, I was not even an author of that, but Helm did that. So they, they take whatever is convenient and they repeat something unrelated to it. 
they hated some procedure, they're going to apply to this, whether it is or not. Now, there are all these other guidelines, every code, AMI, LCD, Cigna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Aetna, and others. So it was value-oriented medicine, which was evidence-based. And some people don't even like the word evidence-based. They want it science-based. Now, it is value-based care, evidence-based plus cost-effective. The Chow and group said that nothing works. They said joint interventions or anything. And this is your tax dollars at work. Stocks sponsored by AHRQ. So we did a counter review of epidural injections compared to review and meta-analysis. We compared everything, what they said, and what was wrong and what was not accurate. And they were totally wrong. So look at cost effectiveness of, uh, we all think that what we are doing is extremely cost effective because we have short memories. Only we remember the successful patient. We don't remember the person who, didn't, who got only one week's relief or no relief, but we remember everybody who got a year's worth of relief for 18 months. I hear all the time their radio frequencies work two years a month. Okay, <laughs> that's good. But why don't you publish the data? Why is it not in the literature? So in any case, this is the normal practices, but we are very cost effective. If you do them properly, our cost effectiveness is good. Compared to non-invasive pharmacological modalities, they keep saying physical therapy is effective. But what they are forgetting is, we are not putting our people who really practice good medicine. We are not putting a needle until they fail the physical therapy. You are not putting a needle until they fail the other treatments. So it is irrelevant if it was effective or not. It already has failed. So this is NIPM QCDR. How many people are joined in this clinical data registry with AVSIP? How many of you are members of it? Oh my God, only one. I should die, kill myself. <laughs> We worked so hard to get this. It helps your quality, quality program, and you don't pay that fine of 9%. It saves you a lot of money. It is easy. This is the only organization where we have our own outcomes. You can do the radio frequencies. You monitor them, how they improve. That counts as outcomes. You don't have to do anything else. The data you already have, is paying for you. Only thing is you have to join. You have to be a member of this. <coughs> so, advocacy. There is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he doesn't mind who gets the credit. Right? That is on my letter card. I show this to every time I send a letter to everyone. So that is the fundamental thing. We are doing all these things. Expansion of CAC membership, multiple legislative initiatives, so this is the bill we introduced in Congress. It passed it through the House. We are working in multiple fronts to improve the reimbursement for all interventional techniques. Every time we go there and start talking to them, they show us the evidence that how much money we are spending on urine drug testing, how much money we are spending on unnecessary treatments. We have to defend these things when we go there. So we have to be reasonable. We have to be guideline based when we do the, these things. So this is the bill, it increases the payment for ambulatory surgery procedures. This is the bill, which this also passes the House, it has to pass the Senate and go to the House. There will be a representative from pain management on the committee which makes the price recommendations into the future. So overview of new fee schedule. This is the CMS administrator made the statement you can read this, your lecture is available, I think, um, wherever it is, so. She said, wasted years of education, training, and hard work, expert as a physician, we are all, they are misusing. She is admitting that all the policies have failed. We spent, they spent $30 billion on meaningless use and EMRs, and it only created problems, increased the physician burnout. So they are trying to change the entire system. As a process, this is what one of the proposed EM payment rates, evaluation and payment services. So, 
this is what we are going to get paid in the future. Whatever the service you do, level two to five, you will be paid $91 for the established patient. But documentation, if you want to say level two, you get paid the same. But if you say level four, you get paid the same, but you have to document higher. You still have to do that. And if you want to put extra units, extra time and extra complications, then you can increase that. It can go up to $150. So compare that to somebody who is practicing in the hospital. This is what a physician gets in the hospital. They get $65. So the difference between 91 and 65 is the practice expense. That is the expense you are spending, renting your building, hiring the staff, building and everything else. But in a hospital setting, you have the advantage, they have the advantage. Hospital bills another 115 for each patient. So the total cost for the patient is $91 there, $181 there. So there is a 50% difference cost to Medicaid. Then why did they push, why are they pushing all these people to hospitals? That is what Obamacare did. They bought all the practices and now they are trying to get out of that mess. So this is how all the costs increase. They are paying double just for doing that. Look at the new patients now. This is what they are going to pay, whatever the level you do, just like. This is the English system, actually. This is what they use in the United Kingdom. A new patient goes to your office, this, you get paid $200. A follow-up patient goes, sorry, 200 pounds. A follow-up patient, 100 pounds. That's it. No documentation, no levels, nothing. So this is, this is where they want to move. So in a hospital patient, this is what is going to cost. The hospital, for the Medicare, it costs $218, and there it is $134. There is difference. This is the part many of us don't understand. This is the site of service differentials issue. So how is this going to affect? That's the slide. I purposefully blocked it so you can't read it, <laughs> so you can. But on the top, like oncology is going to lose it. They are going, it is going to hurt them. But pain management, and interventional pain management, about five to nine, four to nine percent increase. About everything, margin everything, it is only four percent, but right now it says nine percent increase. So if you are doing level three visits, most common one, you are going to benefit from it. If you are doing level four visits, it's going to hurt you a little bit. But if you are doing level five visit, it may hurt you here, but it will save you the slam. So you really need, don't need to be going there, so that helps you there. So either way, it's going to help you. So this is a good thing for us. Chronic complex care. They chose some specialties for chronic complex care. Who are they? Hey, we are there. Interventional pain management is there. See, we are working for <laughs> Negative says that you do the procedure and visit on the same day, you're going to get a 50% reduction in the procedure. We are trying to get that off. So ASC payment schedule, we succeeded in that. We increased the payments for all these procedures. Once we introduced that bill, CMS started increasing these things. So if that bill passes, there could be even more increases. The worst thing is the peripheral neurolytic block. Everybody is talking about how this Genicular nerve, peripheral nerve blocks are effective and everything, but you get, don't get paid any money. You, you can't even get reimbursed for the equipment. Same thing goes with the sacroiliac joint neurolysis. So we are trying to get all of them to be approved at some level. And again, a lot of issues. So if we want to help the organization, you can join champion, promoter, advocate, or supporter. If you are an individual, you can contribute 2,500, 15, or 1,000. If you are a physician corporation, you can do 25,000, 15,000, 10,000, or 5,000. So there are many ways of doing it. Don't say that, well, I gave you $6 on so and so day. That doesn't go too far. It won't even buy you a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> 
So this is our ASIP PAC activity. You see, we used to make a lot of money before. In 2003, 2004, we made 460,000. Now we are pretty low. We accept credit cards. Do you know how much you spend on coffee per year? There's the whole data. Wow. 10.97. So skip a cup of coffee. Help your organization for the future. So that's how the, if you own a surgery center, if you're involved, this is the organization which helps you for that. So we are also publishing the books. Now, Essentials of Regenerative Medicine this is going to be out in February. And this is the top selling book right now, The Essentials of Interventional Techniques. So we have choices here, okay? Forget everything and run, that's the fear. Or face everything and rise. Be ethical, examine your patients, provide medically necessary care. So we all have to face the obstacles and come through with them. The choice is yours. Survival is 100% dependent on fear. Fear is a good thing, but how you use it is the problem. Thank you.